sigmatropic rearrangements. So the last of our three pericyclic reactions. And we've already covered cycloaddition reactions like the Diels-Alder. We've already covered electrocyclic reactions, uh, ring openings, ring closures. And so this is the last one we got left to go. And uh, in a sigmatropic rearrangement, the carbon skeleton undergoes a rearrangement, hence the name, uh, in which one sigma bond is broken and one sigma bond is formed. Now, uh, there's a special numerical notation associated with the sigmatropic rearrangements that students often struggle to kind of see where that comes from and stuff. So we are going to lay that out clearly so there's no confusion in that regard. Uh, and this lesson won't take too long. Now, some of you will actually have this omitted from your curriculum in an undergraduate organic chemistry class. So, but the vast majority of you are probably still going to be on the hook for this. Hence, we're taking the time to cover it here. All right, so we'll take a look at sigmatropic rearrangements here. And, and once again, you're going to break a sigma bond and form a sigma bond uh, in every single sigmatropic rearrangement. And where those occur is going to lead to some numerical notation, as we'll see here. So kind of take a look at the motion of electrons in this one. So we're going to have the cyclic movement of six electrons, just like so. And if you notice, by moving around in a ring like this, every atom in that six-membered system, I can't really call it a ring, so but a quasi-ring, if you will, Every atom there is going to both be losing a bond and gaining a bond so that we don't violate the octet rule in any way, shape, or form. So we are forming a new sigma bond right here, and then we're breaking a sigma bond right here. And where those are located in relation to each other, there's a, a numerical system in which we'll name uh, or at least signify our sigmatropic rearrangement. Now, I want to draw out the transition state in this case. So because the transition state is going to look somewhat like a six-membered ring. So if we take a look here, we've got a partial bond here that's breaking, and I'm going to draw that in blue. So, and then we've got a partial bond that I really put as a partial bond here, but technically it's, technically it's a partial bond in the transition state. All right, but then we also got a partial pi bond for this one that's breaking right here. So we got a partial bond for one that's forming, one that's breaking, and one that's forming in all three of those locations. And so you can see this complete ring of partial bonds in the transition state. So our reactant's not a ring, and our product is not going to be a ring in a second either. But in the transition state, we have a ring-like structure. So just due to all the partial bonds that are forming and breaking. And again, the, the bonds that are forming or breaking that are sigma bonds, so these are all pi, but the sigma, I, I signified those in blue and red because those are going to be useful to us. In fact, I want to really highlight that a little bit better. So I'll do it like so, just so we can highlight where those new bonds were broken and formed. All right, so this is kind of what's going on. Now, one thing you should know, when you're trying to predict the product in a sigmatropic rearrangement, if your reactant is not drawn in such a way that you can kind of see the, the five-sixths of a six-membered ring, so it looks like, a, the way I've drawn it here, it looks like almost like a six-membered ring, like a cyclohexane, just that bond was missing. In fact, I'm gonna take it right back off. So as we've drawn it in the transition state where it really belongs, but it's five parts of a six membered ring. And obviously this is just a straight chain and I could draw it out as a straight chain. But if you're trying to predict the product, you're gonna to wanna to redraw your reactant so that you've got five sixths of a six membered ring, so to speak. And so if we keep going with this and go to the final product here. So, and again, this is technically the transition state. So now we're going to have a new bond to the hydrogen, right like so, that's forming right here. But then this bond to the hydrogen is now broken, but we're going to have pi electrons both here and here and still have that methyl group out there. So there's our product. So again, we've formed a new sigma bond in red in the transition state, and we're breaking one in the transition state in blue. And again, how those are related to each other is how we're going to signify numerically where this rearrangement took place. And so what you want to do is actually count around from sigma bond to sigma bond, starting with the end atom. So let's say I start with this as number one right here. And I want to count all the way over to this atom right here. And so one, two, three, four, five. So that's half of the numbering system. Now I want to go to the other uh, side of one of the sigma bonds. And that just happens to also be the other side of this sigma bond. So, and I want to count how far it takes to get from this end of this sigma bond to this end of this sigma bond. Well, it just takes that one atom. And so most of the time you're going to see more than one in, in most cases. So, but you just want to identify the ends of the sigma bonds and count around on one side, but also count around on the other side. And so we got one there, we've got five here, and this is a one five sigma tropic rearrangement.
cool. Now, this is probably not the best example to start with as far as that numerical notation goes and seeing the one and the five, it'll be a little easier to see on this next example. So, but for every other respect, this is probably the best example to start with. So, because the rest of the reactions are gonna actually have special names. So this next one is called the Cope rearrangement. And again, all these are gonna involve one sigma bond being broken, one being formed, a six-membered ring-like transition state. I probably won't draw the transition state again. I'll probably just signify where we're actually making and breaking the sigma bonds on the reactant so we can get the numerical notation. But I did want you to see it once. So, but in this case, uh, they're gonna get special names here. The Cope rearrangement turns out as a three, three sigma tropic rearrangement by definition. And so in this case, if we look at the cyclic movement of electrons here, we're gonna form a new sigma bond right here. And then we're going to break one right here. So in fact, I'm going to erase that and redraw it in blue just so we can kind of keep track of it. And so once again, we've got the bond, sigma bond we're breaking there and the sigma bond we're forming there. And rather than draw the transition state at, at all, I just want to show you how to identify it on the reactant then. So I just want to say how many atoms does it take to go from here to here and from here to here. And so we got one, two, three, one, two, three. It doesn't really matter which way you number it and stuff like this. So, but from one end of the sigma bond you're forming to the nearest end of the sigma bond you're breaking, it's three atoms included. So, and same thing on the other side. And that's why we're gonna refer to this as a three, three sigma tropic rearrangement. Cool. And again, that's what a Cope rearrangement is. And so uh, it turns out there's also gonna be what's called a Claisen rearrangement in the next example. And a Claisen rearrangement turns out is also a three, three sigma tropic rearrangement. So I just wanna make sure you realize what the difference is. So the Claisen is gonna involve one of these six atoms being an oxygen. So it'll be an ether reactant. Whereas the Cope is specifically if they are all carbon atoms. So that's just to keep the difference there from the get go. All right, so let's draw our product as well. And in this case, we are going to have a new bond right there. So we're also gonna have a pi bond here, a pi bond here, uh, and that's it actually. So there's our new product. Now, most of the time, so uh, you're gonna be able to actually in these equilibrium, you're actually gonna get a mixture of both your reactant and your product, and often you can predict which is gonna uh, predominate uh, in your product mixture. So. In this case, it's going to be about the more substituted alkene. In other cases, it might actually be about having a more stable double bond, for example, or something else in a unique example we'll talk about later as well. So, but in this case, really, it's going to come down to the more substituted alkene. And if we look at the two alkenes in the reactant here, these are both mono substituted. Here, they're both di substituted. And we learned earlier the more substituted alkene is the more stable alkene. And because this product is more stable, so it is going to be favored in the equilibrium. And so we could redraw the equilibrium arrow to reflect that as well. And so sometimes you'll be asked not only to predict the product, but then also to predict which is favored in the equilibrium, the reactant or the product. All right, so in the Claisen rearrangement here, uh, it's also gonna be a three, three uh, sigma tropic rearrangement first off, but the big difference is we're gonna have an oxygen in our almost ring-like structure, our five, six of a ring. So this is gonna be an ether reactant. And typically the way it works for your typical Claisen, we're gonna see an atypical one in a sec, but for your typical Claisen, you're gonna have a vinyl group, a simple carbon-carbon double bond on one side, and then an allyl group, so three carbons, where the allylic carbon's attached to the other side of the ether. So you're gonna have a vinyl allylic or vinylic allylic ether. So as your reactant. All right, we're still gonna have the cyclic movement of electrons. And again, if your reactant isn't drawn in such a way that you can almost see the six membered ring, then you're gonna to wanna to redraw it into that conformation. Uh, we get the cyclic motion of electrons here. So we're gonna form a new sigma bond right here. So, but we can see that we're breaking the sigma bond on the opposite side. So I'm gonna erase that and redraw it in blue just so we can see that it's a three, three sigma tropic rearrangement once again a little more easily. So there's the bond we're breaking. Here's the sigma bond we're forming. And so once again, you're gonna get a, from this atom to the oxygen, one, two, three. And on this side, from this atom to then this atom, one, two, three. And again, that's what makes it a three, three sigma tropic rearrangement. So if we take a look at that product now, So we formed a new sigma bond here. We broke this sigma bond right here. Now we're gonna have a carbon oxygen double bond 
right there as well. We're also going to have a pi bond in this location as well. And there's your product. So, and again, we can talk about which of these actually gets favored in the equilibrium, but here it's not about having a more substitute alkene because here we've got two alkenes, whereas here we've got one alkene and then one carbonyl. And that carbon oxygen double bond with oxygen being more electronegative. So one, this is a stronger and shorter bond. So, but also with the more electronegative oxygen for other reasons as well, being electronegative, it actually lowers the energy. So it's a shorter bond, it's a stronger bond, it's a lower energy bond. Uh, all those things kind of being somewhat synonymous. So, but it is a lower energy bond. And so that's why this ends up being the more stable product. So more stable to have a carbon oxygen double bond than a carbon carbon double bond. And so if we redraw our equilibrium arrows here, once again, in this example, it favors our product. Cool. Technically this is an aldehyde. And if you form an aldehyde, good practice to probably draw in the aldehyde hydrogen. The one time we kind of uh, find it necessary in organic chemistry to draw a hydrogen bonded to a carbon atom. Okay, so that's your typical Claisen, and just want to show you the similarities and differences with the COPE. Again, this is also a 3-3 sigmatropic rearrangement, but now I want to show you a little less typical Claisen as well. So we'll get rid of the COPE here. All right, so your other less typical Claisen condensation, instead of having a vinylic allylic uh, ether, you're going to still have an allylic on one side, but instead of vinylic, you're going to have a phenyl ether on the other side. So it's a phenyl allylic ether uh, in this less typical instance. But again, you want to draw this in such a way that you can almost see the six membered ring here, still do the cyclic movement of electrons here. So forming a new sigma bond right there, breaking a sigma bond right there. And you can quickly see that it's a one, two, three, one, two, three, three, three sigma tropic rearrangement still. And since oxygen's involved, that's what makes it a clason. So if we draw our product this time, all right, let's see if I forgot anything here. Nope, looks great. All right, so there's our product. And in this case, instead of being an aldehyde, it is a ketone instead. Great. Well, we didn't consider this possibility before, but we're gonna consider it now. So it turns out whenever you form an aldehyde or a ketone, so you're typically gonna have both keto and enol forms present. But in most of the cases, we learned that the keto form is usually much more stable. And so usually the keto form heavily predominates. So however, uh, and that's what we didn't even consider up here. We just drew the aldehyde and we're done with it. We didn't have to worry about the enol, but here it turns out as a special case. So in this one instance, the enol is actually gonna be very stable. In fact, it'll be more stable than this corresponding keto form, which is why this is not your actual final product. So, and it's not normally something we check for, but now that you've seen this version of the Claisen, when you have a phenyl allylic ether, so you're not done once you form your ketone product, you gotta go one further step. And so if we take a look at the enol form here, So notice now we're going to have an alcohol and an alkene. And the big thing is not just an enol, like an alkene enol, but it's a phenol. So it's got a complete benzene ring, which is aromatic. So, and that's what's actually driving the stability of this reaction. So with it being aromatic, we're going to talk about aromatic compounds in the next chapter, but suffice it to say, they're very stable. So the uh, pi electrons in an aromatic system are significantly lower in energy, even than a typical conjugated system. And so this extra stability, it turns out making this enol form, which is aromatic, much more stable than the keto form. And so in this case, that lovely pesky thing we learned back in the alkyne chapter called tautomerization is rearing its head one more time. In fact, uh, one more time before second semester is over, we'll see tautomerization and we'll see an, uh, a more stable enol form over a keto form. We'll see it in one other context as well, uh, but definitely not for a few chapters here. Cool, and that is the Claisen condensation. So all you pretty much need to know here. So two different versions of, or two different examples of the Claisen that are likely to come up. And so again, if you've got a vinylic uh, allylic, fairly standard, you're gonna get a ketone or aldehyde as your product. So, but if you've got a phenyl allylic, so then it looks like you're gonna get a ketone as your product. However, it'll tautomerize and you'll get a phenol as your product instead.